there becomes a type of pain, which is the pain of not fully being in the world anymore. You know, we're half in, half out, right, because of this experience. And that pain then needs to be addressed. And it usually means those walls have to be torn down. Mm. We've got to tear those walls down, which means I've got to look at this thing again. But now we can come in and we can look at it probably now from a, from a space where we can, are, are strong enough to process it. Sure. Right. Where, where we have, not to say that it's going to be easy, but that we have at that point uncovered a strength in ourselves to, to look at this, to say, okay, wow, that happened. And it wasn't fair. And it wasn't right that that happened. This is Way of the Artist with Brandon Colby Cook and Evan Schulte. Identifying your blocks and demystifying your struggles so that you can claim your own path and make your life a work of art. Hey, podcast peeps. It's another one with Brandon and Evan. And today... We're going to take you on a little journey going into the past, going back to the present and seeing how all this plays into your future. That's what I got. <laughs> that was, that was nice. That was, that was very concise and eloquent. Thanks. I like how you rate me. You really, I do my intro. It was a very, <laughs> it was a very classy introduction. I felt at yeah. least classy by our standards. Yeah. I mean, cause the, the, the other one that you like to do is hello. Yes, hello. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I, I, I think I've done also a couple of oohs. I've done mm. a lot of, ooh, it feels so good. Yeah, it does. It does feel good. It does feel good. So here we are. And uh, this one, who do you want to be now? And this is, as you've touched on, this one is all about the past. Yeah. And its implications on our now and our future, but really we're, we're taking a magnifying glass to the past. Yes. Our pasts, how that can affect our lives. How are we looking at our past? How are we treating our past and really getting into some of the, the problems and the pitfalls, what we can do about that. So let's dive in. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, human beings, interesting creatures in that sense, because we do consider our past, you know, uh, we actually consciously consider it, we think about it, we draw conclusions, see how it relates. If you look at most animals, they at least for the observation is they tend to be very present. Mm -hmm. Um, And when they when they say, uh, if an animal recoils or something, because maybe it's been hit, it's not necessarily, at least from our perception doesn't appear to be thinking about the time it was hit and the implications of that and what it means. Right. It was more like, Oh, I've noticed this as a pattern and Mm -hmm. this might mean that, you know, so it recoils. Right. Yeah. Um, and you know, that just means that it experienced something. I think the thing is, is that we can actually, as human beings, we can use our past against ourselves. We can use it to serve ourselves, but we can actually, um, have a recoil effect where something scares us and we can actually, because we can be consciously aware, we can actually consciously overcome that. Whereas an mm. animal might not be able to do it on its own. It would take a very caring and mindful owner to help that animal gain trust again. Yeah. But an actual, like a person could actually be their own parent that way. And yeah. I think in a large way, what we're doing is we're talking about the past, but we're talking about almost how to parent the past and how to make it not be something that works against us and not be something we're so victim to or like caught up in an automated kind of way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How, yeah. how we can in, in some regards transcend our past. Yeah. How we can, yeah, not, not just transcend our past, but how we can use our past to, to transcend. So there, there are a couple of, of things around this. I, I'm sure a lot of our listeners have some experience or have heard some things about our past, like don't get stuck in the past 
don't live in the past. These are just kind of general platitudes that are quite commonly thrown around. And uh, one of the things that we like to do very often is, is take on some of these things that are actually good pieces of advice or wisdom, but sometimes are not given enough context or fleshed out for us to really understand their meaning. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get into that yeah. about what it is to get stuck in the past, why that might be a bit of a, a downfall, why that can have uh, destructive effects and, and consequences in our lives. You know, so maybe I'll start with saying that, you know, I mean, the past has been something for me personally that I battled with a lot in my life. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and I think as an artist, um, you tend to look to your past, you look to your experiences to call upon, especially as an actor for emotions and things like that, to try and relate to other characters you play and stuff. Um, you know, I think as just as a human being, I've looked to my past and a lot to try and understand, to try and figure out like why things happen the way they did or what does this mean and that type of stuff. Um, and in certain ways it's been valuable, but in other ways it's been, it's been very limiting for me. And it's been something that I've been actually working on remedying, remedy, remedying a lot. <laughs> there <we> go. <laughs> I got it. Um, you know, because it's something that I do in a way where sometimes it just ends up dragging me down. Yeah. And the biggest expense of getting caught in the past is that what it's done is limited my expression, I've noticed. Yeah. And I think we can all relate to this where, you know, maybe you got burned in a relationship, someone cheated on you or something happened, a business deal went poor or whatever. And now you kind of live a little bit more conservatively. You don't trust as much. You don't put yourself out there as much. Yeah. And that may not be how you want to be. But in some ways, you feel you have to be. And I think what we want to kind of raise here is that you can actually be who you want to be. And you can actually escape this person you have to be, you think you have to be, because that might be this having to be person might be a limited version of you that you don't really want to stand behind. But you just, I think when you get caught in the past and past hurts, things like that, you start to become self-protective. Yeah. And that's why I think a lot of adults, they limit their dreams because we become so protective. We make ourselves so small and then we don't go out and express and live the way we want to live. Yeah, we start putting up walls around ourselves. We start telling ourselves, oh, I can't be this or I can't be that. I can't put myself out there in this way, even though I might really want to. But I can't because there's there's too much hurt there because I had this experience of being burned or being hurt. And I don't want to have to go back there. But the problem is, is that we often just continue to go back to that anyhow, you know, because anytime we are confronted with a new relationship, not necessarily just with people, but with, uh, you know, we have relationships with everything, with our, the place that we live, the, uh, the jobs that we have, the careers that we have, we have relationships with all of them. And so when we're confronted with a situation that, reminds us of that thing, it prevents us from being able to treat this, this thing as, as something potentially new, mm -hmm. you know, it, so we're still drumming up this past. So this, this is kind of the, the funny trick of this whole past game that we play with ourselves is that we, br we set up these walls as a defense to something that we experienced that was negative. And so we're like, okay, I'm protecting myself from this ever happening again. But yet we're always having to face that pain over and over and over again, because we're constantly confronted with something that reminds us of it. And Which so are then, our walls. Yeah. And, and so we're triggered by this thing once again, and now we're, we have to deal with it. So there's no not dealing with it to some extent. Yeah. To some level, there's no way for us to just bypass it. These walls end up uh, not defending us. They become they become limiting. They reduce us. They our authentic expression is uh, 
it's it's curtailed. Yeah, I guess it's limited. I mean, it's it's filtered. Mm -hmm. You know, it gets filtered through this kind of protection mechanism we put in place. The other thing that I found is that, you know, the more walls I put up um, and, uh, you know, other people, I'm sure they can relate to this. But, you know, really, I found that the more walls that I put up, the more it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that I need to have walls up. Yeah. In a weird way, the best advice that, you know, I could share and the thing that I have been realizing more and more is it's a very counterintuitive thing. You have to, in spite of feeling the need to protect yourself, you have to consciously not try to protect yourself because that's the only way you're going to prove to yourself that you don't need to be afraid. Mm -hmm. You need to like take the armor off. You need to, you know, stop being ready to fight. Stop being ready to um, see what you've already seen. And that can be very scary because, you know, like, uh, you know, for somebody who has, you know, experienced betrayal um, and things like that, there's definitely been a part of me. It's like, never again. I never want to have that experience again. I never yeah. want to be so vulnerable that I set myself up to have that experience. But at the same time, you know, if I never allow myself to trust, I never allow myself to express and put myself out there again, I can never have what it was I was looking for in the first place. Mm-hmm. And here's the thing. I mean, one event is one event, but I think we have a, you know, sometimes we, we have a traumatic event occur and we assume that that event can occur over and over again. Yeah. And maybe it's even occurred more than once. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to keep reoccurring, you know? And I I think in in some ways, in a weird way, if you've been betrayed once and then you put up walls so you don't get betrayed, your likelihood of getting betrayed again increased substantially. Yeah. In fact, the best way to not get betrayed is to not put up walls against betrayal. And I know that when I say this, this sounds so nuts, but it's actually the way that you stop it because you, in a way, you create a plot line or a storyline that only facilitates more betrayal by being protective of it. It's, it's very weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is a strange thing. And some people would call that, it's like, oh yeah, it's the law of attraction, you know, and in some ways, and you're creating an expectation you know, with whenever you make that statement of never again, yeah. that's the story of a wall coming up <laughs> Yes, totally. in your, in, in your internal being and how you see the world. And with that expectation and with that perspective to just build off of what you're saying is that, you know, I won't necessarily go into, oh, it's the law of attraction what have you there, there is a kind of logic to this whole thing, because let's say it is something like a, you experienced a betrayal in a relationship or maybe a few and, and it or it's a, something that continues to happen. Well, you built up a wall, which has essentially prevented you from really being who you are, from really being honest when you think about it. Yeah. Now, what, what are these walls, but things that just stop us from being really honest with others and with ourselves. And so we get into another relationship and those walls prevent us from being fully with that person. And because we're not fully with that person, there's always, there's, it's a one foot in one foot out. That person now starts to feel a little bit nervous. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're consciously aware of it, maybe not, but there's something that isn't quite there. And so now they're more likely to step out on you. There, there, there's any number of, of, in many ways, they're reflecting a kind of dishonesty that you're living. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, it's just like they're, they sense that you are not a hundred percent in it, that yeah. you're not fully being who you are. So now they can't really be fully who they are. Exactly. And then all kinds of stuff can spiral out of, control. So there, to me, there's nothing really woo woo about this. There, there's actually no. a very, there's actually very clear logic to how this thing kind of operates. Well, and just because you don't see it operating doesn't mean it isn't operating, yeah. you know, but here's the thing. People have tells and whether we consciously pick these up or we subconsciously pick them up, it doesn't change the fact that they're there mm-hmm. and that we are picking them up. I'll yeah. give you an example. I was talking to a woman who was married and divorced now. And she was sharing a story about, um, the man that she was married to. And, um, 
he made, I think, something like four times the amount of money that she made or something, whatever. Um, you know, he was doing a certain place in his career and she was just beginning hers. Mm -hmm. So um, they were um, they had a house together and they were talking about how they would pay for it together. And um, and the t conversation came up about um, putting in a, the same percentage based on what they made so that they could figure out, you know, how to move forward. And he said to her, yeah, but like, that's not really fair because when we, or if we split up or whatever, it's still 50, 50. Mm. And she was like, Oh, like, and yeah. she, she said like, that was this moment where I was like, Oh my God, like I'm married to this person who they're like, not like they're, that's how they see this. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the thing is, is in, you know, you could look at that and like certain people go, oh, well, he's right. I mean, it's 50, 50, right? It's yeah. like, yeah, but the thing is, is don't you see the way that you're perceiving the future is very telling about how safe that person can feel with you. Yeah. Because in certain ways, like we, by being self-protective, we create an environment where we actually create the very thing we don't want, yeah. but we don't know we're doing it. And that's why you kind of have to, you know, you have to you know, you have to be willing to, um, kind of put these fears aside. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think when you look at like a relationship, for example, just with another person, especially a marriage or something like that, you know, I mean, everybody does it their own way, but I think, you know, in this day and age, we're looking at it more like it's a team. And, and I'll tell you one thing, playing sports and I've, We've won the provincial cup, the best in the province, the best in the state for those Americans, right? Mm -hmm. um, we've we've done that. I'll tell you one thing about team. Team means that we were all there for each other, and some players sometimes we didn't like each other, but we always had each other's backs. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, we're on the team, and for this year at least, we're going to the cup together. Yeah. And the thing is, is some people might get cut the next season, some people might stay, but at the end of the day, you know. The teams that cut each other down, they don't win. Yeah. And, you know, and it's very telling. You just have to decide that like, like or dislike or whatever, or trust or don't trust. You got to decide how you're going to be. And you got to decide that, you know, because you tell people how to respond to you, you know, and when you give them a half in version of you, that's all you're telling, that you're telling them to only give a half in version of themselves. Yeah. I mean, here's the other thing about relationships is you don't get to decide what other people do. What you do get to decide is how you're going to be. And at the end of the day, any conversation that you and I have, all we can do is work with the person. You know, it's you. You need to choose who you're going to be. You know, if you're going to decide to be less of yourself because you're worried about how others are going to be, that's on you. All you ever get to control is you get to show up and, and express yourself as truthfully, honestly, and fully as you are. Mm -hmm. And you can uh, try to attract people who want to do the same, but you give people permission to go full out with you if you do that. But if you go half ass, nobody gets permission. And if you're waiting for someone else to give you permission, you might be waiting your whole life and you might never get it. So I say, take the onus on yourself, fully express yourself, fully be, you know, you're not going to be able to control what other people do. Some people might do things. But usually the other thing too is like, you don't have to be so worried about that because people give tells, they give warning signs. And when you see someone's half in, call them out on it. If you're fully in, call them out on it. Usually things don't ever have to get to the point where something really bad happens. Mm -hmm. But when we're only half in, we can't be honest about whether that person is fully in or not. Because if we're not fully in, we're not going to know. And yeah. if we're only half in and we're blaming the other person for being half in, the first person we should blame is ourselves. But if we're fully in, then we can go, hey, look, I'm in this, but I'm sensing you're not. So what is it? Are you in or are you out? Mm -hmm. You know, you can say that when you're fully in, but when you're half in, you can't say that. You can't call someone out. So you get two half in people who can't call each other out. Of course, problems can happen. Yeah. Pretty simple, really. Absolutely. I mean, you know, but we do these things. We justify being half in. We justify the self-protection, you know. Yeah. Yeah. All of these, all of these guards and things. And, and again, this, this has so much to do with our experience yes. of the past. And to get back into what this is, really what we're talking about is how 
the way that we look at our past has implications of our ability to fully express in the now. This is such an important thing that as artists you start to to learn, but this is a valuable thing for for us in our lives, more importantly for our lives. Yes. So, I mean, from this angle, we've been looking a lot at maybe negative things that have happened. You know, we've experienced a, 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 a trauma. We've yeah. experienced a betrayal. We've experienced something that we would consider as, as not a positive thing. And so we form these walls and these barriers. I also want to just touch on this very briefly, which is that even, even our successes and our accomplishments can in the past can become detrimental to us in the now Mm -hmm. and to us creating uh, uh, all kinds of of possibility in our in our present and future so let's let's talk about that because i think what we're going to do is we're going to present the problem here which we've been doing Mm -hmm. and then we're going to kind of come up with some kind of solutions and some direction and we already guided kind of towards the direction which is be fully in whatever Mm -hmm. you do but let's kind of We'll get to that more. We'll expand on that more. But right now, yeah, this whole thing about accomplishment totally can work against you because for one, you can try to recreate the same accomplishment and stop yourself from ever being able to experience anything better. Yeah. But the thing that's better might not come the same way that the positive thing came before. And so the problem is, is you keep trying to repeat something you think works from the past and yeah. that's a that can become a big issue. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we can learn from our past. Absolutely. We'll maybe get into more of that later because I I'm, don't want to say that there's no value to our past because obviously it is a rich well for us to draw on. There's just kind of a better ways of doing that than others. But I, I brought up this example with you. I know you're familiar with it. And I've brought it up a number of times before, but the author, Elizabeth Gilbert, I can't remember where she talked about it, but. I feel like it was a TED talk. I feel it was like a TED. Yeah, maybe it was a TED talk or a podcast or something like that. But she had brought up that after she had the the success that she had with uh, Eat, Pray, Love, which was a huge selling book turned into the movie. Most people are, are fairly familiar with it. And. When she was done with it, she had people, friends, strangers alike saying, oh, after the success that you've had with this, aren't you afraid that you'll never, (laughs) you'll never achieve something that great again? And her response was, well, of course I'm a, that, that's gone through my mind, but I, I can't, I can't write my next thing if that's what I'm thinking about Mm -hmm. all the time. So this is how, again, this is how another way that our past can be something that prevents us from being free. How can someone like her possibly be fully in, as we talked about, fully in with this new endeavor, with this new sort of adventure of a new book in her life. How can she be completely free to do that? If in the back of her head, she's going, Oh, how can I make this as big a success as the last one? It's just, you just can't have that in, in your mind while you're doing, doing this thing, Mm -hmm. because I mean, there's all sorts of reasons for that. For one, you don't have any control over that. There's not really anything that you can do that will guarantee that level of success. The best thing that you can do as artists learn, begin to learn as, as they go on and, and mature as artists is that you have to be as authentic and in your expression as possible. And that has to be the main thing Mm -hmm. is just to be and communicate with as much truth as you can in, in your music, in your, acting in your poetry in your painting in your whatever it is you have to be honest whatever that is to you however that speaks through you and by honoring that then you have in a weird way that's when you have a shot at kind of recreating a success but if you are 
trying to do a new thing while you're trying to to keep success of something old, you're never going to be able to do it. Well, I think mostly because things change, you know, it evolves. Like, like one thing that worked in the past doesn't necessarily work today. You know, just like something that didn't work yesterday might work today. Um, you know, there's sometimes you have these artists, right? Like, uh, you know, I think of um, someone like um, Chuck Palahniuk, who wrote Fight Club, mm-hmm. who was way ahead of his time. But, you know, it took people time to catch up to some of the things he was sharing. But, you know, the thing is, is that you look at the film Fight Club and the book, which is equally exceptional. Um, you look at that and you go, wow, this is so it resonates so much and it just resonates. It seems every year past, it was made in 1999, but every year past 20, you know, 20 years almost now. And it is more and more relevant every single day. Mm -hmm. So he was arguably 10, 20 years um, ahead of his time. Mm -hmm. But this is the biggest cult classic movie. One of the biggest cult classic movies of our generation Mm -hmm. and of time that, you know, just failed miserably in the box office, but has done so well on resale DVDs and video on demand and this type of thing, you know, because basically it took people time to be able to get what was being said there. But the thing is, if he was inauthentic and tried to do the thing that that film never would have been made. So, you know, you don't really know. And, and the thing is, is that I think, I think when it comes to like the past, it's, it's great to look at and kind of like in the sense that you can kind of go, okay, well, you know, if I would have like, this is how I kind of went about it poorly. This is how I'll go about it now. I mean, you can look at things and kind of take learning lessons and kind of see how to improve. Yeah. But I think that you need to take the, the past much less personally. I think where people get caught and, and I definitely myself, I get caught is I make it so personal, mm-hmm. you know, and it doesn't. I, it's hard to say that because, you know, people go, but it's my past. It happened to me. It's like, yeah, but if you were like a person watching a movie, you wouldn't take this so personally. And your past is kind of like just a movie you replay. It's not yeah. really like it's over. You know what I mean? So you might as well just watch it like a movie. Just watch it like an audience member. Just observe it and like, go, oh, OK, this and this and this happened. What would I tell that character as opposed to like me and I should have, and I could have, and if only, you know, yeah. that's where a lot of trouble occurs. I think. Yeah. And we just keep, as the expression goes, living in the past, we yeah. keep living there. But the thing is, there's no way, this is the redundancy of, of living in the past is that it's like, well, you can't. Yeah. You can't do anything like other it. than in your own mind is that, which is happening now. You're just in the now and in the now you're choosing to live in the past, but there's no way you can't, you know, we know it, it's obvious. It's trivial to say that we can't go back there and change it. That's just not possible. So what is with all of the wasted time and the wasted energy in doing yeah. that in, in beating ourselves up or in regretting something or feeling guilty about something that occurred back then. Yeah. You know, you know, you know I'd done this, I've wasted, I mean, I don't know. I don't know, whatever life is life, but in, in a sense, I've wasted a lot of time and energy going back in the past, thinking about if I did it differently or if I could change it. And there's a fun little rabbit hole. And by fun, <laughs> I mean, it's painful, <laughs> but you could go down this rabbit hole and you could go, okay, well, let's say I could go back in the past and change it. What if, there was a consequence in changing what you thought would make your life better actually made it worse. So for example, like take the person you love the most in the world, right? You do the thing that you feel would have been the better choice, but the person you love the most in the world dies because of it caused and or stopped or didn't stop some other event that was going to occur in the world. And that mistake that you made actually helped something else, but you don't know what that is because you didn't get it personally benefit from it. And the person you love the most dies, but you got to do the thing right. And you got to do it the way you wanted. Would you prefer that? And I think the thing is, is like, this is the problem. We could go back in the past and say, I should have done it this way. 
but we don't know if the way that we did it was exactly the na- the way it needed to work out and was actually the best way it could have worked out. Yeah. Even though we don't, it didn't go personally our way, the way we think it should have or, or would have been best. Maybe that actually was the best because th- yeah. th- we just don't see all the effects around all of our choices in life. Right? And that's a story that a lot of people have in, in their autobiographies and interviews of uh, people who are kind of, I guess we would say noteworthy. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you, you hear that story all the time of some event that happened way back when in somebody's life. And then looking back on it, people say, oh, no, that was the best thing that could have happened. You know, that's that's so frequently the case. And again, it's the lens in which we look at it. And, and I know we'll get into it. Something, and it's kind of funny that it just occurs to me right now, but I'm just going to bring it up. If anybody watches this show, they're probably going, yeah, this is exactly like that. <laughs> I I'm I watch uh, The Flash. Okay. It's the TV show. Yeah. And it, it deals with a lot of cool things. And, and one of the big themes that it plays with is the past. Because you have this character, the character of Barry Allen, who, when he was a kid, witnessed the, the murder of his, of his mother. And it affected him and he struggled with it. And he becomes the Flash. And then through his adventures, he becomes able to actually break the time barrier. <laughs> right, because he can run so fast. Because he can run so fast. Yeah, and right. and so there are, are storylines within the Flash sort of canon where he goes back and he changes time. He saves his mother. And it has all of these horrible implications. Right. And and so it's this common story within, within its own storylines that... You know, he goes back and he changes it, but then he realizes that it's a mistake, that to change it, he loses all of these other things that he treasures so much in his life now. You know, people who were, became like family and friends, suddenly they weren't in his life anymore. And he's like, how can you place more of a value on one thing over the other? So the story usually ends up going where he goes back and he has to stop himself from saving <laughs> right his own own mother from being being killed you know and it's just like it's well that's cool yeah there's some pretty crazy storylines but it's it yeah. helps us kind of it's illustrate the effect yeah you know you kill the butterfly and uh you know or whatever and then what's the effect of that in, in you know in all these other ways yeah and uh save the butterfly kill the butterfly all this stuff i mean i think the solution at the end of the day is when because we we we've, we've talked about that is the best thing you can be is as authentically truthful and honest in your expression that are upholding your, your principles and values and your sense of self as just as best you possibly can right now. And that, whatever that is, whether things work, if they fall in your favor or don't, you can know that you were being true on your path. And then the, the effects of that will be the effects of that. But I think like the the only error that we ever make is not allowing ourselves to be fully present and authentic. And I mm-hmm. think unfortunately, I think and I, I don't know. I mean, this is an assumption and a guess, but I think m- most people are playing far, far too safe. And really the the only fault we make is putting up some walls and putting up these things and making excuses for not being true and authentic and not doing what we truly care about, Mm -hmm. you know, but maybe we have to walk down the road far enough, not being authentic to realize the value of what it means to actually be authentic. Yeah. You know, and in some ways, unfortunately, you have to do it wrong to learn how to do it right, according to you, you know? Yeah. Because how would you know? You know, it's it's many ways you have to make the mistake before you know to do it another way. And I think when the past, you know, when you look at the past, don't look at the past as like, like, thank, be thankful of your mistakes, yeah. you know, be thankful of your errors, because they are what made you who you are. You know, the other thing is we can play this game again, you know, let's say you could go back and change what happened. Imagine you wouldn't be the person you are today. Because I think yeah. another thing is when we fantasize about going to the past and changing it, we assume we would be who we are now today as well. Yeah. Right? Like we would have the awarenesses we have. But what if you had to lose all those awarenesses? 
don't you realize that you would probably make other mistakes that would be just as costly or even more costly because you didn't get that necessary life experience from the mistake you made earlier? So the past is this really like, it's, we really got to remove ourselves from it. It's mm-hmm. so important. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's this game of, of thinking that we need to be something other than what we are, you know, and it's, it's, as you're talking and another piece of, of culture and media enters my head. You remember the movie Bedazzled? Okay. Uh, oh yeah. With the devil, right? Yeah. With the yeah. devil is Elizabeth Hurley yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. Brendan Fraser, funny, yeah. you know, and he makes all these agreements with the devil to be someone other than who he is you know, to change his life. So it was like, Oh, I want to be more like this and more like that. And every single time it's like, yeah, he, he becomes some sort of different idealized version of himself. But every single time there's always, there's always some price to be paid for it. He's not, he's not the same person that, that he is like, as you were bringing up, it's like you change something, but you, you're not the same person anymore. Mm -hmm. And in a weird way, he learns his sort of lesson and the devil teaches him this yeah. lesson. There's a saying. There's that- probably a really, you could probably do a very <laughs> in-depth breakdown of Bedazzled and explore a lot of different themes and ideas that you are know, going on. I think a it. lot of the best comedies are like that. They have these weird, like, kind of really important and profound lessons in them. You know, there's this one, uh, one comedy I really like, pop culture thing, but it's called Click. And it's with it's an Adam Sandler movie, oh, yeah, yeah. but it's really brilliant because he starts fast forwarding parts of his life as though they're not meaningful. And then what ends up happening is, as he goes on, the 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 controller that he has basically starts automating, like fast forwarding it whenever an event like that happens. And this one point he, um, he you know, when he goes to have sex with his wife, he fast forwards it because he doesn't want to have to put in the effort. And then every time he has sex afterwards, <laughs> it gets fast forward. He's like, no, 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 I don't want this. Yeah. So it's it's kind of like pointing out that like in every moment you're in is important, you yeah. know, but there's but it's a silly little comedy, but it kind of brings part, you know, some interesting yeah. points and of view. Right? It's this thing of making our past wrong, you know, and the expression of shoulda, coulda, woulda. Yeah. You know, that's. And it, that's off, so often used as like, it's a very flippant thing. It's like, yeah, well, shoulda, woulda, coulda. You know what? There's something very intelligent about it, you know, because it's like, well, like, look, what are you going to do? Like, yeah. you're going to keep, you're going to keep living in that thing. Like in that, in that should have, could have, would have, if only it's like there, there's, it's, it's completely nonsensical. It's, it, it's almost borderline insane to keep living, you know, we have our moments where we do that, but to continue to live in that place is kind of insanity Mm -hmm. because there's, it's, it's trying to change what you can't change. Right. You know, like, and going over it as if you can. Yeah. It's, it's, it's silly. I mean, it's all just a, it's all just a game so that we don't have to just do the one thing we need to do, which is accept ourselves and love ourselves yeah. and be okay with where we are and, and, and who we are and, and whatever. You know, my brother said this, I remember, and he started saying this for a while and I thought it was really funny, but he used to say, he used to go, shoulda, shoulda, coulda, woulda, didn't. <laughs> and he yeah. added didn't at the end of it. He's yeah. just like, didn't, it didn't happen. So it doesn't matter. You know, it's like, shoulda, coulda, woulda, and didn't. And you kind of make a joke out of it, which I thought was kind of funny because it's like at the end of the day, yeah, you should have, you could have, you would have, but you didn't. So it's time to move on. You know, it's, it didn't happen. And this, all this should have, could have, would have is like, but what if it did? Here's yeah. the bottom line. It didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? So you, or, or it did happen or it didn't, but like, other than that, that's it. Like there's no more, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think like, you know, life, Life is, life is painful, but pain does not have to be something you suffer about. Yeah. You know, I think the key thing here, you know, one of the cornerstones of this conversation is that the pain we experience once doesn't have to be the pain that we carry with us every day moving forward. You know, pain can be victim or pain can be growth. And I think the key thing is that, you know, when we look at the past, the past is an opportunity for growth or an opportunity for victimhood. And I think what basically we're pointing out is like, 
Don't let your past ever be something that allows you to be a victim. Yeah. Consciously make it a something that can help you grow. But whenever it's not making you grow, then it's then there's no point. There's just no point in, you know, getting yeah. yourself all worked up about it. Yeah. It's we lose our ability to be now. Mm-hmm. We lose our we stop living the lives that we have now the more that we we continue to look into the past. And I think that we've I think we've covered to a large degree at this point, you know, like the yeah. problem with the past, its effects on our now and its potential effects for our future, basically of we just continue to repeat the past the more we continue to look at it. Mm-hmm. Now, as we mentioned earlier on, I mean, our our past are a very rich well of experiences and that's not to be discounted. So for me, what I want to take some time with is for what seems to me is how we treat our past. It's the way that we look at it, that we can look at our past and have it be something that is empowering as opposed to looking at our past and having it reduce us to something that is less than. Mm-hmm. Because this is something that I, I think is very, very important. And I see it a lot in our culture, which is that for the most part, most of us are looking at our past in a, in a very, as I said, reductive kind of way. It's like, well, this happened and this happened and this happened. So I'm this way. Right. Right. And we like reduce just, ourselves to these events. Yeah. It's yeah. like, you know, we kind of brick wall ourselves yeah. in a thing and, and, and put ourselves into a little box that way. We're just like, okay, well, I'm just the product of this. You know, we're just the result of a bunch of conditions that we, we didn't necessarily have control over. I mean, that's a really bleak perspective on life when you really look at that. You know, that you're just this because of all of these things you didn't have control over. So there it is. Mm -hmm. Like, where do you go from there? There's no place to go from there. But so often that's how we we look at ourselves in our culture. It's a justification. It's a justification justification to play small. I mean, here's the thing. To not fully be who we are. To not fully express. It's scary to fully express. Mm Mm-hmm when you haven't done it and you haven't seen that you could be okay doing it. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's, it's a frightening thing, you know? And so if you look at it, we have a lot of reasons why we want to justify why it's okay to play small. So, you know, the past becomes this great alibi, you know, for a lot of people it's like, yeah. Oh, well, okay. Like, yeah, but I can't really do it. Cause I'm this way because you know, my parents did this to me or, or so-and-so did that to me, or this happened in my life. And it's like, the, 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 the title of this episode is who do you want to be mm-hmm. now? You know what I mean? Like not who you are because of this. Yeah. The, the title isn't, I am this way because this happened to me. Yeah. It's who do you want to be now? In spite, Cause that's a choice in spite that's of an this power choice. Exactly. Yes. And, and that's not to say like, like, you know, everybody has a past and we have all gone through things that are not fair and things that we did not have control over, you know, things that, that we could not help them, you know, for, for whatever the circumstance was, that's, that's a fact of life. Now we can use those things as we've been discussing to, to reduce ourselves to just a a product of something. And then we can just remain stuck there and, and we just stay stuck there. Cause that's the nature of it is, mm-hmm. is it just kind of always just folds back in on itself. Right. And then you look at this one thing in the past and, Oh yeah, this is the way I am because of this. And then once we've looked at that, we look at everything and it's like, Oh yeah. And then this happened. And that's more of the reason why I'm that way. So it, this is, as we were talking about <laughs> to start this one off, you just start to look at the past as the thing to, for you to continue repeating the same things over and over and over again say, well, you know what? That's just the way it is. That's just uh, like, and, and it's a very disempowering thing and it doesn't lead to any sense of, of well-being or us to be able to really fully live 
our lives. So a, a notion that was brought to me, and I'll just refer to a couple of these authors. One was an author by the name of Thomas More, and another one by the name of James Hillman. And they're both, uh, you know, very, uh, they're internationally uh, recognized, kind of acclaimed writers who are both in clinical psychology. And their response to to this kind of reductive nature that's gone on in psychology of this sort of reductive process is that we look at our past with a sense of myth Mm -hmm. that we look at our past with a sense of poetry something that is is extraordinary and and i want to bring this up because we're way of the artist Mm -hmm. you know like let's bring artistry into looking at this thing totally because we can and and we got into this before we we started the recording but you know we've both written scripts i mean you're definitely more of the screenwriter than i am but if we were to write scripts from the way that we treat our pasts of uh, in this reductive nature it would be it would be garbage <laughs> like it would be and, and that it's not just for scripts that would be for any any storytelling medium if it was told in that extent nobody would would want it nobody would want to read it nobody would it would just be at least so, if that's all it was if that's all it was yeah. it would just be like well what's the point of this right storytelling as an art form and the and there's something deep within us that responds to it because we keep telling the same stories and we never get tired of it yeah and it's always a story of transcendence it's always a story of overcoming something and very often has to do with the past you know we can watch a movie we can read a book that is about some uh, that's about someone who had a, a horrible childhood or some terrible trauma occur in their lives. But if it just stayed there and just being like, well, I'm just the way I am because this happened, people would be like, holy shit, can I have my money back, please? (laughs) Like, this is so depressing. But no, we love the story. That's about somebody transcending it in spite of these things, about those events those challenges those struggles becoming the raw material in which somebody becomes something more that's the story that we that we want to want to see that's the story we want to hear that's the story we want to read mm-hmm. and we can do the same thing with our own lives why not do that with our own lives instead of saying like well this i'm just this way you know that there's nothing to be gained there mm-hmm. instead we can look at ourselves we can look at our at the place we came from and see it from a sense of, of a, of a great storyteller, of a great poet, of a great, and, and to be like, Oh wow, my life has been filled with these characters and these challenges. And I, and I came and I went through these things and I came out the other side, Yeah, you know, and from that place, we can start to see the strength that we've, we've had. We can see the, how we've overcome things and, and see ourselves as these extraordinary characters in our own lives. And from there, we can start to find a way forward that is no longer defined by a past. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I mean, one of the big things about screenwriting is, you know, one of the first questions and this isn't just me, but they say you should ask is that where does my character end or where do they start? And then if it's, if you're looking at where they start, what their challenge is, what their problem is, how are they different by the end of it? I mean, you want to make, that's their arc. You want to make them different by the end of it. Or if they're this person by the end of it, who do they need to be in the beginning to make that an interesting journey to become that person? Yeah. I mean, they've been, you know, they've been doing this with superhero movies more and more where they've been kind of showing how the superhero transcended into being the super and the people are interested in that mm-hmm. because, you know, they want to see someone kind of overcome, uh, you know, these challenges. Right. And if they don't go or grow anywhere, 
you know, the journey isn't as interesting. And I think that, you know, the, the note to take away from this really is that if you're feeling like your life's totally fucked up and like, you're just failing at it and you're, who do you want to be? Right. And then you just ask yourself, well, what, what do I need to do? How, how do I need to start being and doing to overcome this to kind of, cause I have, if you have, and this is where the law of vision comes in. You have an idea of how you want to be and you just go, okay, well, what does the person who I want to be do to become that person? And then no matter how shitty your life is in this moment, you can kind of just go, okay, well, I'm just going to start doing these things. And, you know, and, you know, the other thing is I think, you know, and everybody has their own little belief system, right? And we don't know, we don't know who's right, who's wrong, but just choose one that works for you. I like to choose a belief system that the universe is kind of going to serve me and give me the things that I need to help me transcend and evolve and Mm -hmm. overcome things. Because, like, I've had some experiences, and I, I don't want to play pity war or compare who's had what story, but I've had things that have been traumatic in my life. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the one of the ways that I got through those traumas was to simply go, okay, great, how am I going to use this to become better? How am, how am I going to use this to learn and evolve? Um, you know, and I think uh, most of my life I've done that. I've had a few blips in my life where I've been like, oh, man, like everything just sucks. And I don't know how to get out of it. I don't know what to do. And I don't even know what the point is. And that's when I started to hit like depression. Mm -hmm. But then eventually, the way out of depression was the same thing it always was, is you got to look at like, okay, how am I going to rise above this? Because, you know, the past can be this thing that just, it just sucks you down and makes you so small and makes your life so limited that you don't even want to live it, that you just want to escape it. Um, you know, and I like, I like this analogy, you know, turn your, turn your past into, um, a myth or poetry. Like your life is a story, right? If you're an audience member watching your life, it could be very interesting. That's why I say you got to like, when you make, when you tell a story, you might bring your personal part of you to it, but you don't take it personally. Like, like a good writer also, you know, part of your job is to put your characters through hell. Yeah. But you do it because you know that that's what's going to make the story interesting. That's going to make them grow. In some ways, if you're going through hell, don't look at it like you're like, Oh my God, my life's so tough. Don't take that so personally. Look at it more like an audience member going, man, like look at yourself going through a hard time from almost an observer and be like, wow, like that character, me is going through a really hard time right now. I wonder how he gets through it or she gets through it. Yeah. Then you're going to start to get excited about how you're going to transcend this problem as opposed to getting all personal and going, life is hard. Everything sucks right now. And it's woe is me, right? Like we don't watch movies going, woe is me. We don't do that. Yeah. Right. And, and there's a very valuable thing in being an audience member of your life and particularly being an audience member of your past. Audience members are removed from the story. They might empathize, they might connect to it, but they are at least one step removed from it. Yeah. You know, where they know that it's not happening to them. And in many ways, your past is not happening to you. It happened maybe to you, Mm -hmm. but it is not happening to you right now. But we don't live like that. We live as though it is happening to us right now. Mm. And that's just not the case. So, I mean, going back to the title, who do you want to be now? If this isn't happening to you right now, right? Yeah. You're free. All of a sudden you can express how you want to express. But if you keep living like the past is happening to you now, there's no way you'll ever be able to express the way you want to express. But it just isn't. I mean... It isn't happening to you now. You might feel it. You might be taking it too personally, but it isn't, you know? And listen, here's another thing. Trauma and terrible things that happen in your life, sometimes you have, you're going to have to go in, dig in, and confront those emotionally. Maybe you need to talk to a therapist. Maybe you need to do some writing on it. Maybe you need to do some work on it. I think that's healthy and important. Yeah. Not to just shove it away in a corner and pretend it didn't happen, but there's a healing process to like, I'm going to look into this. I'm going to feel this a little bit so that I can kind of, you know, work through it and not just pretend it didn't happen. But remember that that's a healing process. It's not about like, that's just about self care. Mm -hmm. That's not about like, 
you know, making yourself a victim. Yeah. You know, you're just feeling it so you can kind of it's about still Work making it. yourself triumphant in that whole thing and yeah. giving yourself a space to do that because to, to take it a few steps back here again is when we experience these, these traumas, as we talked about these walls that we put up, you know, that, that was there. We can honor that. We can respect that because the way that I see it is that this happens because wherever we were at, at that time, you know, the walls were, were the best we were able to do. Yes. At that moment in time, because for whatever, uh, our circumstances were, we didn't have the tools. We didn't have the ability to understand, comprehend at a, a functional enough level to, to be able to, to properly look at it and, and process it. So we, create these beliefs in these walls, right? But eventually as we, there becomes a type of pain, which is the pain of not fully being in the world anymore. You know, we're half in half out, right? Because of this experience and that pain then needs to be addressed. And it usually means those walls have to be torn down. Mm. We've got to tear those walls down, which means I've got to look at this thing again, but now we can come in and we can look at it probably now from a, from a space where we can are, are strong enough to process it. Sure. Right. Where, where we have not to say that it's going to be easy, but that we have at that point uncovered a strength in ourselves to, to look at this, to say, okay, wow, that happened and it wasn't fair. And it wasn't right that that happened, but it happened. So now I'm going to look at this thing. I'm going to feel it and I'm going to let it go so that I can live again. So mm-hmm. I can live fully. I can be more of, of this person that I sense that I am in the world. And I can be more of the person that, that I want to be in the world, but I can't be that person as long as I'm holding on to this, to holding on to these walls Mm -hmm. that are around me. So there is, there is, I I, I guess what I'm trying to say is to bring it back to, to where we got to is that this is where seeing ourselves in an empowered place can help us when we look at these things, because there is a value in looking at these things when the time comes up because they have to still be felt and gone through to a certain degree. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's how are we looking at it? What is the frame in which we're looking at? Are we looking at it in a sense of, of as I've been saying, reductive product kind of thinking? Or are we looking at it as a, wow, look, <laughs> wow, <laughs> <laughs> as a, with a kind of wonder and awe, at the story of our lives, you know, as a myth and as poetry to say, wow, look at this thing that I went through, that I made it through, you know, that's extraordinary. Yeah. And to me, this is where, uh, appreciation comes into. And I think that very often our past, if we were to treat our past as a kind of uh, a figure as a, as a person almost is that our past really just wants to be appreciated. And if we can appreciate our past, we can find the healing that we're looking for. But if we don't have an appreciation for our past and the thing, and and I mean everything that we've been through, then I think we're going to have a hard time letting it go. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think you're right about that. I mean, it's <clears throat> the the past is the past does need to be confronted at times. It does need to be looked at and and there is a part of us um looking at our past and healing from that. Um there's something I wanted to bring up. We kind of moved on and I didn't want to stop the conversation, but 
there is conscious awareness of your past. And then mm-hmm. there's like the subconscious or unconscious part of your past. And, um, you know, something that I realized, like, you know, I realized at a certain point there was an unconscious part of my past where, you know, f- for a large part of what I was doing, I didn't realize that like that was coming from certain things that maybe I experienced in childhood. So for example, uh, you know, f- feeling like I didn't, I didn't really recognize as a kid that, um, that I experienced neglect. Like as a kid, to me, that was like, oh no, this is just normal. I actually thought, you know, and they say this is actually a psychological phenomenon. Most people believe their families are better than most other families, Mm. even when they have really terrible family experiences. Right. But we tend to believe that our family has it right and that most people's, it's better than most people's, (laughs) ironically. Right. Even if it isn't. Yeah. We just have this belief. So uh, as a child, you end up growing up. Uh, you know, you end up having this experience that everything is normal. And in fact, probably better than what most people are going through in a weird way. And so even though something may be happening, which isn't good, you don't ever question it. So then what's happening is you could have an experience like that, like neglect or abuse or whatever. Um, And then you can grow up and then you can kind of um, unconsciously be functioning from a place of because I was neglected, I had to do things to try to get attention. I had to do things to... So what ends up happening is you you have unconscious behaviors of, if I don't do this, then I will basically be neglected. I won't get any attention. I won't get any love. Mm-hmm. And so what ended up happening was there's certain behaviors that I had to reconcile that I was doing, which were basically just a byproduct of me not... Or me feeling neglected. But here's the thing. Once you make the unconscious conscious, you are no longer subject to it. So part of healing the past is sometimes making it conscious. But once you're conscious of it, there's no more need to ruminate on it anymore and make it like this thing. Like, because when I started to discover unconscious things about myself, there and I became conscious, there was this tendency to be like, oh, but if only, and like, and then suffering about it consciously. Mm -hmm. And what I've kind of learned is that once I become aware of it, it helps me to um, behave different and be different now. But I don't need to be caught in anymore. I just understand, oh, that's why I probably did what I did. But not from a victim point, just from a like, oh, that there's a cause and an effect. Yeah. And the the thing I want to, this reason why I bring this up. see it now. Yeah. The thing I want to bring up with people is that There is a cause and effect with your past. Mm -hmm. Your traumas and things like that that occurred in your past are causing effects today. But the the unconscious effects, they're what you want to become aware of. And once you become aware of, you can kind of move on from them because now you're aware. Yeah. Um, But there may be very well things that you are unconscious of that are causing you to behave or be in a certain way that you wouldn't want to be. And I think part of like, understanding or psychology or, or talking to people who have, you know, I don't necessarily talk to a therapist, but I have enough people around me who, um, may as well be, um, but (laughs) you know, the, uh, the idea that, you know, other people can sometimes help you bring the unconscious to surface and then you can kind of go, Oh, Oh, I see why I do that. Oh, no need to do that anymore. Like, it's like when I was a little kid, I didn't know how, to do anything different. But like, as I got older, it's like, Oh, I do this because I, I feel like I won't get love unless I do this. Is that actually true? And it's like, well, no, that's not actually true. But it took me time to become aware and then remedy that behavior. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So like, my point is, is that, you know, we're saying, who do you want to be now? There's a certain part of you that is unconscious. And so long as that is unconscious, you can't help but be that unconscious person. So part of becoming who you are now is about bringing the unconscious to light. And that is something we all have to do. And the more yeah. conscious and aware we become, the more we're able to choose and be who we want to be. But there is a part of it that is secret to each of us about ourselves. Mm-hmm. And I think that's part of the psychology. That's part of the uncovering of self that we all have to go through. 
And, um, you know, that's why you, you know, that's why I journal. That's why I do things like this because they help me uncover my unconscious self. And I realize that's a very important part of becoming autonomous in your life. Yeah. Yeah. And I would just say as, as kind of like a, a simple note, as far as if, if you're on the other end of this and you're wondering, okay, so how do I start to become conscious of these unconscious things? I would say as a general rule of thumb, look at the fears, right? Look at where you become afraid. That's usually a good indicator of where you've built a wall, right? Of where there is something that you picked up along the the journey of your life that, that is not necessarily, well, I mean, it is yours to some extent, but you know, it's something that you picked up. Yeah. You know, you didn't start out with it. Let's yes. say that much. You didn't start out with it and is something that you you came to believe and is something that you've been uh, potentially nurturing on an unconscious level and you've been living your life in this way. Yeah. And, so, you know, and don't blame yourself. You just didn't know any better. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing, too, is like, you know, and that's the should have, could have, would have game, you know, because we go, oh, I should have could have would have done this but like also remember that when you did that or didn't do that you were functioning from a certain place probably unconscious Mm -hmm. and you didn't realize that what you were doing you know you have an awareness now like that's the thing about conscious awareness when you become consciously aware you can begin to use the past against yourself in a really bad way because you become Mm. consciously aware and you go oh i should have done this in the past but really, like in the past, were you consciously aware? You probably weren't. And that's why you did what you did. So when you say you should have, could have, would have, you have to understand that, no, you you shouldn't have. You couldn't have and you wouldn't have. Yeah. Because you weren't consciously aware at the time. Now you are. Don't blame yourself. That person was getting you through that. Yeah. One other thing I want to say just before we introduce the beer and, you know, talk Wrap about things that. things up. Is... You mentioned before we even had this conversation and you brought this up kind of in the conversation about how, you know, our past self, you know, you kind of pointed out that like we created a past ego and that ego at that time, you know, and I think I had this conversation with you a while back too, but in some ways we have to thank the person in the past for being the person that got us through what we got through Mm -hmm. and their time, their ego, their identity might be done. And we might have to move on from that person we were yeah. to be who we are now. But at that time, that that person we were got us through. Yeah. And there's one thing I always try to remind myself is like, and it's a weird little thing, but it, it's and it sounds silly, but it's like, hey, I'm alive. Like I made it. Like in spite of all the shit that happened, like somehow I'm still here and I'm yeah. still like I'm alive. And like. I think when you ever want to be present, just remember that you're alive. And like, if you were born right now alive and you didn't have a single memory of your past, how would you be? Right? Because our past does not have to make our alive right now be anything other than what it is. But yeah, you know, that's, it's, it's a simple little reminder, but it can help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It reminds me of a, of a, a meme that I saw a long time ago that went something like, Hey, you reading this, you're alive and you're still here. You're a fucking badass. <laughs> or say it was something like that. Like you're still standing. You're a badass. Yeah. You know, and it's like, it's, it's, it's true. Give yourself, yeah, yeah, give yeah, yourself, give yourself some, some credit. Yeah, yeah. Give yourself some credit. Yeah. And, and yeah. And that person that you had to be, even though it's time to move on, you know, again, it's the appreciation thing. It's like show up. That's, that's appreciating who you were in the past Yeah. and say, Hey, you got me through a really tough time. You know, thank you very much for doing that. You know, I'll share one more thing, actually, um, just a personal life story, just to relate to this event. You know, I went through a a depression. I've talked about this and, uh, you know, it got, you know, a few years ago and it was, it was, it got to a point where it was pretty severe. Like I was just basically like, I was really sad. I was really like repressed and depressed and down and it spent a lot of time alone, just kind of going like, what's the point question in life. And, um, you know, fortunately, before I went into that depression, I had, I had made quite a bit of money, but I um, quickly started spending all that money and I wasn't really making anymore because I wasn't 
out there because I was depressed, right? And uh, but I would go to this cafe and I would these cafes in my neighborhood and I would just I would have a meal and my meal often would be like twenty dollars, you know. So twenty dollars every day, you know, maybe even a couple times a day, just to get out of the house and be out there and write. And I eventually spent all my money and then I started to spend credit and then I started to go into debt and, you know, and it wasn't just from meals, but they were definitely a big expense during that time. Yeah. And then, you know, afterwards I was kicking myself. I'm like, why did I spend all that money on this food? And like, what a yeah. waste. But, you know, I had this realization one day that it was like, no, I need to thank that guy. Because even if I got to pay the debt that he occurred for me, he got me through one of the hardest times in my life. Yeah. And if I have to pay for him to have done that shit, because I don't want to live that now. Yeah. <laughs> he went through it for me. And if he needed to spend some money for us to survive, I'm alive today because he figured yeah. out a way to keep going. And, that's... and if I got to pay for that today, then that's worth it. So like I've learned to look at my debts that I occurred from that time as a time of like, shit, man that guy was a survivor yeah. and he did what he had to do, you know, and I will gladly pay for that today. Like if it was my own child who, who was going through a hard time, I would gladly pay for that because I look at it as like, you have given me the gift of today. Even mm -hmm. if that, if that's what it cost, cause the other, it could have gone the other way. It could have gone that, you know, I jumped off a bridge or something like that. Yeah. You know, it could have gone that way, but, but, Going to a cafe and writing and doing that for me got me out of the house and it got me get feeling some sense of connection and purpose. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't have a lot of people to really talk to at the time. So I made friends with a lot of people at the cafes and, and that gave me a social life. Yeah. I could have hid away in my bed in my place 24 seven because, yeah. you know, anyone who has depression knows that it's fucking hard mm -hmm. to get up some days. I just, I was like, I'm, I don't want to even leave the house, but I'm just going to go to the cafe. I'll get some food. I'll do some writing. Mm -hmm. And the, the other thing is I'll share one other thing about that. One of the things that kept me going through that hard, hard time was that I remember being like, well, if I keep writing every day, every single day I would write. If I keep writing every day, I must believe that there's some future. Because when, when, when I was super depressed, it was like, man, I don't know like if anything's ever going to work out again. But I started to notice that I was writing every day. So I was like, I must be, you know, I must believe that there's some way out of this because I keep yeah. working on it, you know. And, and I think that sometimes, you know, that's, that's all you can do, you know. And I look at that past person and I could go, man, like, you know, I wish that never happened to me. I wish I could have been different. But it did. Yeah. And it was. And now I'm here. I, I I love that you shared that story because yeah, that's that's everything that you know we've been kind of talking about as as far as this it, that looking at your past with a sense of myth or at least with a sense of creativity. Sure. You know to be to, because it is there's you can go the direction of being like oh I was such an idiot I spent all of this money and blah 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 I put myself into debt you know, I, I should have been more responsive. Like, you know what? You, that's an obvious kind of lesson. It's almost a, a trivial lesson to some degree, but to look at that and say, Hey, the person who got me through that, thank you. You got me through that time. You know, there's you no, know, there's something very profound there in its place. Something that's a lot more productive and looking at our lives, you know, having a sense of, of what we've been through and our strength in that story. The money, who gives a shit? You know, but the the person who who survived something very difficult. No, that's that's compelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you know that's what we all want. That's what we all want. I mean, we all want to see like when we're going through a hard time, if someone else survives and their story is anything like ours, it gives us hope. You know, and I think that's the part of the reason is like, you know, whatever your struggle is, you know, and I've definitely felt super alone and like I was the only one going through the struggle. Um, you probably not as alone as you think, you know, no matter what your struggle is, like even if you're in the present moment, like right now, someone might be listening to this and we're and they might be beating themselves about the past, but they're in a troubled moment right now. Mm -hmm. Just understand that your troubled moment is human. 
Like we, 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 not all of us go through the same thing, but many of us go through probably something that you're going through. And even if Evan and I haven't personally gone through what you're going through, probably someone else has gone through something similar. And you know what? Someone survived. And the thing is, is that can give you the hope that you can survive and transcend and not even just transcend, but something beautiful and amazing might even come out of it. In but fact, probably will probably if will. you see it through Yeah, and just, you're paying attention. So, you know, you just kind of got to hang in there. And, 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 you know, in the past, even if the past was, and you brought this up earlier, I just want to mention this. I feel this is really important. Before I hit depression, my past was this glorious time mm-hmm. of all these people throwing these big parties, you know, and kind of living out my dream, making my show. You better believe that played into my depression. Cause I was like, life used to be so good. What went wrong? You yeah. know, like, and then it's like, now I'm beating myself up because life isn't the way it was. And I don't know why, but you know, I was going through a bit of a, maybe an existential crisis. I was going yeah. through a, whatever. But the thing is, is that the past is something it's 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 something that you have to be delicate with and 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 I really just believe you know you need to remove yourself from it at times and really like what Evan was pointing out is look at it as a myth look at it as a story Mm -hmm. look at it as something you can you know be an audience member of and say wow like look at that guy who got me through depression like as though that wasn't even me you know what I mean but like it was me but like but like he lived it I'm not Mm -hmm. him anymore today like who do I want to be now is not the guy who was in the depression, but he, when he was that way, got me through it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and, you know, I think you can try on different characters in your life. There's still you, but you don't have to take it personally. You were that character for that time because that's what you needed at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this beer, this beer, man. Well, tell us about it. <laughs> this is, uh, <laughs> so this is, I, I was so curious with this one because I never heard of this before. I, I'm familiar with the brewery, which is Degarad. I think I'm saying that right. But uh, this is, uh, they're a Belgian style brewer in Burnaby, BC. And in fact, this is called the uh, Burnabarian. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a Belgian style table beer. And I never heard of just a uh, table beer. Yeah. I was like, what the hell is a table beer? An unfiltered ale. An unfiltered ale. And uh, yeah, it's just it's just kind of a, a beer that's just about being kind of easy to drink. And, and you can drink a couple of them without too much difficulty. <laughs> and it has, I love on the back, it says it has a silky mouthfeel. Oh, any, <laughs> anytime that mouthfeel is included, I just feel oh like it's, God. it's a little bit absurd. A but silky mouthfeel. Well, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's been pretty good. It's a little bit, it's got a little bite to it, you know, like a little bit of a, not a bite, but like a, it's got a bit of a, of a tartness. A tart, I think. I yeah. guess that might be it. Yeah, kind of. It's like a little. Yeah, bit it's of, like a tart. Yeah, know. it's kind of like a, and it is a slight little and sort a of silky like mouthfeel bite. <laughs> Got a little bite to it, but I've been enjoying it. Yeah, no, it's been good. I liked it. Um, I've liked it. Yeah. Um, so by the way, this isn't an advertisement for a beer company. We just have a beer. It spurs on the conversation. We always like to present a craft brewery. Yeah, part of the tradition. So yeah. Okay. Well, um, what are our I mean, final thoughts here? I mean, I. Uh, I'm surprised at how, how this one's actually kind of flown by and how long we've been talking for. So, I mean, for me, I, I, all I hope is that, you know, we've, we've illustrated sufficiently, you know, the, how, how the way that we look at our past and, and, and bring it into our present, what those implications and potential consequences are. And I would just, again, reiterate, if you find yourself navigating the landscape of your past (laughs) on some dark and quiet night, and if what's happening is, is causing you regret, is causing you pain, suffering of sorts, guilt, guilt, shame, shame, 
anxiety, all mm-hmm. of these things, if that's happening to you, then time to get creative, time to channel your artist and begin to look at your past, see how you can make yourself the great Greek hero yeah. <laughs> in your own mythological story. Look at how you can, you can view yourself in a new light, in a new perspective that is no less true. That is absolutely no less true because the fact that you are here and now is proof that you are the hero who survived the things that were thrown at you. Mm -hmm. You're already the proof that you're it, that you are the hero. So begin to look at your past and your life in that way and let it go. Find a way to let it go and have it make you stronger. Hmm. You know, I, I wait, I'll say this. This podcast is way of the artist. It's, it's, it's a way of incorporating artistry into your life. You don't have to be an artist for these philosophies, these concepts, these, these ideas to work. You know, it's about taking your life and bringing some artistry into it, you know, Life is more than just events. Life is more than just um, things that happen. And, you know, you're, you're a human being who has the ability to make meaning and, and see patterns and filter and frame and just project and do all sorts of really cool things. And that's your artistry. And you will do it either consciously or unconsciously. And I think in a lot of ways, what this talk is really about is about two things. It's about making the unconscious conscious, consciously deciding to make the the meanings in your life something that you choose, something that is of your design. And then secondly, expressing yourself based on who you want to be now and who you're choosing to be now and basically unhooking yourself from the past. I feel like the past is like these, it's this baggage, it's this anchor, you know, and we drag it sometimes. And it's like, pull up the anchor, unhook yourself (laughs) from it, you know, leave the bags, go travel light, you know, Mm -hmm. travel light for a moment and let yourself have that, you know? And I think, you know, this is a practice. It's something that you're going to, you know, you're, you, you know, just from this conversation alone, you might not be able to incorporate this 100% in your life just yet, but you can start, you know, and, and I think what this conversation is really just trying to do is just trying to bring to light some things. And then from there, you know, maybe you can travel a little lighter, you know, in the now. And then if you're lighter, I think it gives you a little more freedom of expression. And that's really, that's the aim that I think we have for everybody. Well, that's it, everybody. Travel light. Thanks for listening to the show. If you got something out of this, if you feel it improved your life or your journey in any way, please take a moment to subscribe, leave a review, or share the episode. You can also support us on Patreon, where we have tons of great bonuses. You are the ones that make the show possible and help us to thrive. Thank you for joining us.